Well, when Iowa City and shopped for groceries in the 1800s, in the first part of the 1900s, there were no supermarkets, were there? There was no such thing as one-stop shopping. Shoppers needed to visit several stores in order to purchase everything they wanted. They would trade with a grocer, a baker, a butcher, perhaps a milk and cheese vendor. And before 1930, family-owned mom-and-pop type grocery stores constituted the bulk of the retail grocery industry. The way we brought groceries began to change by the late 1920s. And by the 1950s, the number of mom and pops were beginning to dwindle rapidly. So the goal of today's presentation will be to trace the development of the grocery trade in Iowa City beginning in the 1800s and bring it up to the present and talk a little bit about the future of grocery shopping. So we're going to describe the grocery trade in Iowa City in the 1800s, um, kind of briefly, I guess discuss the 1900s grocery stores, the early ones, talk about some of the businesses that were associated with the grocery trade, describe a grocery delivery system that was used in the first part of the 20th century that many of us may not know about, and show the astonishing number of grocery stores in downtown Iowa City in 1930, and then spend some time talking about the 40-some existing buildings in Iowa City that were once grocery stores no longer and then presents some information about our present supermarkets, talk a little bit about the future. Iowa was first a territory and then in 1846 it became a state. Grocery stores were defined in the statutes of 1839 as places where spiritus or vinous liquor, liquors are retailed by quantities less than one gallon. The groceries were assessed from $25 to $100 at the discretion of the county commissioners. According to Irving Weber, the first grocery store to open in Iowa City was located on Clinton Street between Jefferson and Market. That's the current site of the UI College of Business Administration building. The year of opening was 1839, the year in which Iowa City was selected as a site. Maybe the store looks something like one of these. Uh, well, if they could have procured milled lumber, that's the question, perhaps by steamboat coming up the Iowa River. But the store was opened by a Charles S. Foster. It's likely that the Foster store dealt only in dry grocery goods, those that were non-perishable. So people had to buy the other things at other stores, at least by the later part of the 1800s. Neighborhood stores still only handled basically dry grocery goods. By the 1840s, a method for canning food had been developed, including the recent development of a method of mass producing tin cans. What were these tin cans actually made out of, do you suppose? Steel. And they were coated with tin because the iron imparted a taste to the food. But of course, we commonly call them tin cans. But the use of canned food probably did not come in the mass usage until sometime after the Civil War. According to the history of Johnson County, 1836 to 1882, Iowa City had three grocers in 1844. In 1856, we had six grocers, one butcher, and one oyster agent. In this book that I found happened across in a bookstore in Springfield, Illinois, this man relates that, quote, most Iowa stores had a handy customer barrel with a tin cup hung beside it and proffered a swig to farmers traveling from a distance and then bade them Godspeed when trading was done with another for the road. That was nice of them. On the other hand, Lawrence mentioned that on rainy days when farmers could not work outside, they might come to the store to lounge around while using the stores around the fire. One Missouri merchant lamented, I am a storekeeper and am excessively annoyed by a set of troublesome animals called loungers <laughs> who are in the daily habit of calling at my store and they're sitting hour after hour poking their noses into my business, looking into my books whenever they happen to lie exposed to their view, making impertinent inquiries about business which does not concern them, and ever and anon giving a polite hint that a little grog would be acceptable. 
as we can see in these advertisements in the 1857 city directory, typically a grocer also dealt in the sale of dry cloth goods, boots, and clothing. Iowa City was fortunate to have the railroad come through here in the beginning of 1856. Although the line stopped at Iowa City, it did not begin going westward until five years later. But later in the year 1856, a railroad bridge over the Mississippi River was completed and thus Iowa City was linked all the way out to New York City when they changed to the Rock Island line in Davenport area. So with the railroad available, grocery items could be shipped to Iowa City quite early on. I used Iowa City city directories in gathering much of the information on grocers. Here's one stack of them that I combed through at the State Historical Society building. They usually like you to look at them on microfilm, but I talked them into letting me have the actual copies. Much easier to scan a hard copy than going through microfilm. And of course, if you want to take some, some digital pictures of them. Here's a listing of the grocers in Iowa City in 1868. Because no street numbers were used at that time, the locations were referenced in this manner, such as Dubuque Near College or Washington and Dubuque. Here's a picture of the John Seidel grocery, perhaps in 1868. I mentioned that there was no one-stop shopping such as we have today. Here's a listing of the food vendors in the city directory in 1868. Six bakers, four butchers, two butter and egg vendors, two canned and green fruits vendors, 20 grocers and one oyster vendor. So here is an 1882 grocer's ad from a city directory. The owner declares that he sells on average two carloads of Kansas flour a month. Mr. Whitmore announced that he had, quote, only one price to both sanguine and skeptical. <laughs> King and Company delivered to any part of the city free of charge. Among other things, Joseph Koza sold tripe and pig's feet. What is tripe? Intestine of a cow. Or perhaps part of the stomach of an ox or similar animal used for food, yes. Mm -hmm. Right, it's part of the intestinal system. It doesn't sound very appetizing. So English eat a lot of tripe. Tripe. My, tripe pie. my mother used to have an expression, my tripe. Have you ever heard that one, or is that just a local thing that she used? Saunders grocer, grocer was the sole agent for E.B. Mallory's oysters. There's the oyster thing again. You would frequently see things proclaiming things about oysters. Here's some information about the Lefevre grocery. He bought live chickens, ducks, and geese, and killed and dressed them in the rear of his store, which is probably very common to get things from local... <coughs> local farmers. Here's an image of the George W. Lewis grocery in, on 108 South Clinton in 1895. That was between Washington and College Streets on the east side of Clinton across from the old Capitol Center. Frank Nugel had his new national grocery at 332 East Davenport Street in the first decade of the 1900s. This was just west of Gilbert Street. Note the brooms, chicken baskets, and barrels. Here's an image of the interior of the Sangster grocery in about 1910. It's kind of bright and leached out. It sat at the present site of the Iowa City Public Library building. And this is not an Iowa City grocery, but it's a typical 1920-era grocery store. You can see that the merchants would have to get the goods for the customers. They're behind the counters on racks, at least most of them. There's a barrel in the front that could have likely held pickles or crackers. Pickles were scooped out of a barrel and flour came in barrels or sacks. 
Weber got a kick out of a flour sack being 49 pounds and not 50 pounds. But before sugar came into bags, up until the middle of the 1800s, sugar was molded in cones, weighing anywhere from under 12 pounds up to 55 pounds. A large pair of pincers known as sugar nips was used to break smaller pieces of sugar off. Granulated and cube sugars weren't introduced until the second half of the 19th century. Crackers came in the proverbial cracker barrels. Lawrence stated that the cracker barrel was commonplace in stores, standing open as a convenience for sampling. The first sign that bulk cracker distribution might end came in 1898, when the National Biscuit Company began marketing their Unita soda crackers in family-sized patented moisture-proof packages. It's funny how milk delivery came to homes even in the latter days. When I was a kid, they still delivered milk to my house, although you could certainly get it in grocery stores. Ice had to be delivered, of course, to put in people's ice boxes. My dad always referred to the refrigerator as the ice box. Mm -hmm. He was born in 1912 and, of course, grew up in the era where there were just ice boxes. This is a view of an Iowa City ice operation. Ice was being cut from a pond. I think they also cut from the Iowa River. And this is a University of Iowa operation. Well, also, of course, we had butchers because early grocery stores didn't sell meat. Often a lot of sawdust on the floor. What was that for? Blood. Yes. Soak up blood. And I imagine that doesn't go over too well these days. It might have been in part what put out of business some of these small grocers. The sawdust smells better than the blood, too. It what? It smells better than the blood. Well, I bet it does. It does. Maybe it sort of moderates the odor. I actually kind of like the smell of it. Our grocery store lists have sawdust on the floor. We have butchers. Yeah. Of course, we also had bakeries to go to to get our bread and pastries. Here's a recollection of John Nash. Uh, his grandson is a friend of mine, is also his name of, of John. John was a wholesale dealer from about 1920 up until the 70s. He recalled that stores got their merchandise in bulk in wooden boxes or wooden barrels, raisins, rice, prunes, lots of different things that weren't packaged individually. In the 1925 Iowa City Telephone Directory, Many of the Iowa City groceries specified that they were cash groceries. However, in the 1920s and way beyond, it was common for grocers to extend credit to customers. They allowed the shoppers to run a tab, but they sometimes had trouble collecting. <laughs> yeah. Before supermarkets became established and widespread, the mom and pop stores remained vibrant. Large markups from wholesale prices were necessary for the owners to remain in business. Stores were often located only a few blocks to, to as little as one block or less from each other. People could walk to them, often had to walk to them. Friendships were established between the storekeepers and the customers. Large number of grocers lived above their stores. Mm -hmm. And farmers once acted as wholesalers and brought eggs, cream, butter, chickens, ducks, and so forth directly to the grocers. And this practice extended into more recent years. For example, some of you remember the Me Too grocery. A friend of mine named Rick Walters, whose family lived near Morris on a farm, kept 1,200 to 2,000 chickens on their farm. And each week they would cull as many as 50 of them and bring them to the Me Too grocery. They'd be sold as stewing hens. Another friend of mine would bring wild mushrooms, not just morels to the new Pioneer Co-op, I remember, the one that is there where the Me Too was on Van Buren. And I think the government's kind of put a stop to that. You don't even see morels anymore in high vs When I moved here 35 years ago, they were selling morels in high v stores, but maybe there's some regulations now. I don't know. Wouldn't be surprised. Another friend of mine related a story about apples. He worked for a grocer here in town 
And this man would go over to Illinois, well, this is hard to imagine going, even though that's only maybe 60 miles, and he would buy these barrels of apples that were hand packed so that they had more apples than a barrel that was just put in willy nilly. And he'd bring them back here and repack them in this way and, and be able to make more money on a bushel of apples. That's what he told me, anyway. <laughs> kind of interesting. Weber told of a man named Rufus McKnight who came up with an idea and created Merchants United Delivery. This is that delivery system I alluded to in the introduction. The service provided a means of delivering the groceries and meats of shops to homes all around the city. I couldn't find a picture of one of their delivery trucks, so I made this one up on my computer. <laughs> they, they had four deliveries per day, 8 and 10 a.m. and 2 and 4 p.m. There were 10 delivery routes and horse-drawn wagons were used. This isn't one, of course. The back doors of the customers' homes always were unlocked and often a note would be left with some cookies or candy for a treat, Weber said. No one remembers what mud charged the grocer or meat market for each delivery. Most customers, but not all, were considerate and never ordered more than once a day, he said. But someone remembers a woman who lived in the 1100 block of College Street who ordered fish four times a day to feed her cat. <laughs> and some customers called in orders for every delivery every day, which provided most irritating, not to mention costly for the grocer. Everett Means once had a customer call in to order one spool of thread. Merchants United Delivery operated from the mid-teens until early 1940s and proved to be a success for both the customer and the merchants. Early Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> Now here's what I thought were all the grocery stores in 1930. It turns out I missed some. There were some 47 stores listed in the city directory in 1930. But this is most of them. And I think I've got a pretty good accounting of what ones were downtown. That's the part that amazes me. Within a two block radius, there were 16 grocery stores. Here's a present day view of Dubuque Street looking south from Iowa <coughs> Avenue. In the heyday of downtown grocery stores, there were as many as eight groceries in the two or three blocks of Dubuque Street south of here. So I'm gonna take you on a little tour now of the buildings and houses that I've identified in Iowa City that once housed grocery stores. You'll be familiar with most of them, but a few may surprise you. You will remember the names of a lot of them so I spent quite a little time going down memory lane here on this. I've identified over 40 existing buildings. I cover quite a few of them here. But anyway, going back to on Dubuque Street alone, over the years there have been grocery stores at 31 different locations. And most of them have been demolished, some 19 of them in the 100 and 200 blocks of South Dubuque Street. So even though many of the former grocery buildings in the downtown area have succumbed to urban renewal, there are many that are still standing throughout Iowa City. And one of my friends refers to urban renewal as urban removal. In the, here's the Atlas restaurant, which once had an Iowa, well, I guess it does have an Iowa Avenue address, but it once had a Dubuque Street address. A number of businesses operated out of here. Yeah, it was one South Dubuque Street. From about 1900 to 1940, there was a Polar's Grocery. Anyone remember that name? This is gonna predate most of us, all this stuff that I'm gonna say here. On the other side of Dubuque Street where the Deadwood Bar is, which I have not been in, but uh, it might be fun just to do a bar tour sometime. In 1909, it was occupied by the Barth Shepherd and Bostwick Grocery. The upper part of the front of the building looks like it's had a facelift. Mm -hmm. Just south at 12 South Dubuque Street is the Sports Column Bar. It looks like three old buildings there. Beginning in 1890 or so, 
A number of grocery stores have occupied some of this space. The 100 block of South Dubuque Street on the Ped Mall had at least six grocery stores. The construction of the Jefferson Hotel built in 1913 and the Plaza Center One resulted in the destruction of some of them. However, two or three of the old structures have survived right in the middle between those two structures. Here are two of them. 111 South Dubuque Street on the right housed the Joseph Benda Grocery in 1919. And I don't have a complete listing of years, but this is from the directories. It's either a starting year or one of the years in most of these cases, or a lot of them. Now the building next to it there was once the Cozen McAllister Grocery Store. You know the McAllister name from south of town, the new McAllister Bridge that goes over the Iowa Avenue, or Iowa River? the McAllister Mansion on Sand Road, probably the same family. Here's the Coza and McAllister Grocery in about 1950. Note the big cash register in the front there. I included this, although it's not existing now, it's where Plaza Center 1, the north end of it is, but it was the Ben White Book Grocery seen in 1938. It's just one of the few old grocery building pictures that I have. And this building on the Ped Mall is actually not the one I centered on. I think the one to the far left housed groceries in the 1930s and even 20s. Economy Grocery and Ben White Book Grocery. And then where the Sheraton Hotel is, it had some groceries in that area, one of them being the Means Brothers Grocery. Some of you may remember that one. It was first on 212 South Dubuque Street in about 1922, and then on the other side on 219 from 1930 to 1967. Some of you were here then. Their stores were located just south of this or about where this is. The Broken Spoke, do you know where this is? This housed groceries at least three, by at least three names in the 1930 to 1950 era. Don't know if you recognize any of those names. And of course you know about the little cottages that succumb to the wrecking ball just south of there. You remember this one as the A&P store yep. Yep. on South Clinton? 1959 to 1974 was its run. There's a comparison of the look of presently and before. This is Giovanni's restaurant in the east most block of the Ped Mall on College Street. The Piggly Wiggly had a short life here before it was replaced by the longer lasting self-serve grocery. In the first years of 1900, Charles Wood and Fred Evert operated grocery stores out of the building operated by Donnelly's Pub. How many of you remember the last grocery that was there? Rebels Food Market. That was one that, yeah, that was a one that would be known to some of you and just east and across the street from Donnelly's, where Gray's now exists, the Barth brothers operated a grocery business in the early 1900s. The Taste of China had, is it pronounced Peppel? I've heard it different ways, it's P-I-P-A-L. It was a meat market. Helen Peppel was there. And the present ugly saloon what a name, um, was occupied by the GM market and grocery from about 1936 to 1938. Now you, many of you have been into artifacts perhaps. That was once a grocery, at least two groceries, J.J. Rittenmeyer and Jacob Goldberg. Wouldn't be surprised if the owners lived above. Now we get to the notable John's Grocery. 
the only mom and pop still in existence in Iowa City. <laughs> John Albert Heskey started his business there in 1949, about 100 years after the building was built, still operated by the family. Previous groceries operated out of this building, including Dennis Valentine in 1930, George Gardner in 1940, others. So we don't think of it as being other grocery stores, and, and it was used for lots besides that. It once was a firehouse, I understand. And then it became a bar. The 1920 Sanborn fire map shows it housing a manufacture of perfumes in a cigar factory. And then it was made into apartments. Today, John's carries perhaps over 2,500 kinds of beer. John's has capitalized on their Dirty John's moniker by putting that name on the size of their delivery van or vans, which they park in my church lot, St. Paul's, just down at the end of the, of the street there. Here's a statement by Bob Hibbs regarding the derivation of the name Dirty John's. It was these youngsters from Central Junior High, now in the Mercy Medical Plaza, that gave John's the notorious name Dirty John's. In 1956, a group of boys stole an entire stack of Playboys that had been delivered and promptly passed them out to their classmates. The principal, not knowing the entire story of why his school was inundated with these magazines, gave Johns the name that many know of the store by today. And here's an early view of John's grocery, well before John was there. Look at the windows, too. Do you, any, are any of you familiar with this building? I live next door to it. Oh, good. It sits right almost on the sidewalk there. For more than half a century, it housed at least four different grocery businesses. It was built in 1875 or before, so it's one of the oldest extant buildings in Iowa City that once housed mom and pop grocery stores. This building has had a facelift recently. It's a little house that's just off of Clapp Street on Market Street, just west of Clapp Street. And it housed a bunch of grocery stores. Must have been quite a little operation. This building's a bit of a mystery. It looks like an old foundation there, but according to records I have, it may have housed a grocery store, but it's a little puzzling because it's at 606 and the address of the grocery was different, uh, 604 maybe. But there at least were a lot of grocery stores on that corner. And of course, Poly Eyes. This building was built probably in 1875, probably for a hotel and saloon. You see the big white curved thing at top there that once had some signage on it. Here were the grocery stores, at least some of them that were there. Do some of you remember self-serve grocery until 1959 or later? It was run by a man named Tweedy, I was told. It's interesting. See, here's the sign, Holub, Holub or Holub? Holub and Son, the National, on the top there. Do you remember this place? The Bowery Street Grocery. It's had a real colorful history. Groceries were in operation from 1897 until 1975. It's now on the National Register of Historic Places, commonly referred to as the Bowery Street Grocery. There was a Teresa Mahan, Goldberg, that, I mentioned a Goldberg who might have been at Artifacts. I want, don't remember if that was the same name. Ranella, we had a Ranella grocery in another part of town too. At least 10 different grocery businesses. A friend of mine told me that it was run by some quote unquote hippies for a time around 1971. A number of cats were kept in the store and they kept open cornmeal and oatmeal barrels and they f didn't always cover them up. Apparently some customers were complaining that they received some unexpected little brown Tootsie Rolls in their goods. 
it was said that the store was shut down but came back to life as the new Pioneer Food Cooperative in 1972. So there wasn't much of it, so it transitioned very rapidly, yeah. hopefully. I visited the store last year and talked to the owner. She calls it Zaza's pasta. She makes her own pasta and sells it. She showed me what she thought were original shelves and one original window in there. And it's, it has housed two apartments, one up and one down in the past. And we all know about this place on Summit Street, the Deluxe Bakery. Do you remember it as food stores, anybody? How many of you remember this as a grocery store? Perhaps had a different look to it then. Where is this located? Right across Kitty Corner from St. Wentz. Do you remember it as Doc Kehoe running it as People's Grocery? Doc and Gwen Kehoe. You mean after the grocery business? Well, now it is kind of a design ranch. They have furnishings and different. Is that what you knew it as when you bought something? No, I'm not sure. Yeah, Could have had a different name. Design ranch, it says. But it was occupied by all of these grocers, at least. And then after Doc got out of there, it was a Hawkeye Dairy for just a few years at the end. You might remember that. I had a conversation with Gwen. She's still alive. Doc died years ago. But the thing about this that kind of exemplifies what some of the small groceries could do is she said that they raised five children on the income from their store. And they operated it for about 20 years. And this was some 20 years after Hy-Vee had come to town. Wow. And they sold all sorts of groceries. The meat business that they generated that they had generated a substantial part of their income. They supplied fraternity and sorority houses and restaurants to individual customers. I think state agricultural regulations started to put a damper on their meat cutting operation. Peoples bought fresh produce from local farmers. It was most common for peoples to run a tab for customers. Most people would, would settle up with them just fine. She let me take a picture of a drawing that was on her wall in her apartment of Doc there, standing outside the business. This home, which looks like it has had an addition or something, is, looks a little odd about it, housed groceries under several names. Prezik's had the longest run. Do you remember that name, Prezik? See, it's getting to be now where people are going to not remember these things because they're getting so old. Do you know where this building is? Just south of the Ace Hardware store. It housed at least eight different groceries over the years. you think that might kind of kill it, yeah. wouldn't you? <laughs> See, 1949, let's go ahead. Well, 49, I don't know how long after 49. That's where, okay, that's where but Ace, yeah. Yeah. it wasn't until 64 that Eagle came there 15 years later, so I don't know <coughs> what, what the interim period was there. Okay. And Eagle operated it then for almost 40 years. Yeah. This little house is up near the hilltop bar, but on the other side of the street. Yep. You recognize that somebody does. This also housed groceries under at least eight different names. All the stuff that must have been a grocery, that's been, the front's been remodeled. Mm -hmm. I remember, but uh, uh, it always looked like it must have been a grocery. Yeah. And of course, here's the hilltop. A lady named Linda currently runs the business and told me that after Prohibition ended in 1933, the Hilltop obtained a liquor license. 
What was the business known as for a short time? Does anybody remember the nickname? Last stop, last uh, yes. chance. Yes, yes. Uh, First chance, name. last chance. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> right. It's kind of on the edge of town. The Samuel White book grocery was here and then these others before it, at least those. Here's the Randy Turcha law firm. I believe he pronounces it Turcha. They're a little short on vowels, I always say. So they, T-R-C-A, right? It once, you remember Gump's Grocery? Some, a lot of people remember the name Gump's in Ralston's. Here's the Buffalo Gallery Antique Store, which is a building owned by the Watts family. And we'll get to the Watts Grocery in just a moment. And of course, Seaton's was the most recent grocer there, but it was occupied by a lot of other groceries. Palmer's, Hunter's, Hardfix, and Cunningham before Seaton's. Seaton's had the longest run, I think, of, of any store. Here's a picture of it when it was Hunter's. See, Hunter's was in the 1940, early 40s. Note what they were selling out in front there, those old gas pumps. Hmm. Here's Watts Grocery, right? Yeah. You know that, that's also an antique and collectible place that's never open. <laughs> but it was also White Books and Smith's and also filling stations. So they must have had pumps there, probably in that little asphalt part that's just up the street there to the, to the right. Watts was one of the last mom and pops to go out of business in Iowa City. Yeah. Muscatine is not only an arterial street today, but it was US Highway 6 before the bypass was built. Yeah. And when was the bypass built? Late 1950s? been a busy roadway for a long time so it's not surprising that there'd be a lot of groceries along there. What about this little place that's been converted into a house? This was once Stoner's Food Store. This is where three streets come together. Muscatine, is it 4th Avenue and... Yeah. It's a little tricky there. It's a, yeah, it's a little tricky. And here we have some facelift that's occurred I believe on the rightmost building, the right building of the two, was, is it Grizzle? Della Grizzle and the East Side Food Market. What about this building? This was Benner's and Giant Store. Do you remember those? Some of us must remember those. We've been here that long. And this is a building that is on, on uh, Rochester. Rochester on Rochester, just west of Clapp Street. It's been occupied by a physician, a group of psychologists, and now renovated by something else, but there were at least five groceries there. Any of those names familiar? Probably not. Yes, which? Uh, Kern and Jones, I do genealogy and they're both of my family. Oh, oh good. Now what about this one? Psychologist building here, just up, oh, right just here. to the east, yeah, right. on the right. north side of the street. This was several groceries, and the most recent was Clem, and I think it was called Clem's Grocery. Here's Clem chomping on a cigar while entertaining a little girl on his counter. Clem's was gone in 1970. Bob Hibbs described the demise as due to both Clem's death and the domination of the supermarkets. Number of, gro number of grocery stores have been at the Joanne Fabric Store. You remember Giants there, probably, but maybe not Shalides. Shalides. And you remember, of course, there was an eagle here, too. Oh, yeah. What about this little place? Does anybody recognize where that is? Yes, Prairie du Chien Road. 
and that was Cunningham's grocery at least for six years. I didn't have any data on it being anything else. This is just across the street from Kinnick Stadium and it housed grocery stores also. Now what about the Arrow Rental Building? Do you know when that came to town? I was surprised it was quite as early as it was. 1953. October of 1953. And they occupied it up right into the early, very early 80s, because when I moved here in 79, it was still a high V. I don't suppose it had any, did it have windows, do you remember? <clears throat> that they bricked up, or has it always been that way? There's windows on the other side. Yeah. Does this look like a former grocery store? No. Yes, right, basically right east of the funeral home of Lensing. Do you remember this as a grocery? Yes, I do. Oh, and this, this very structure. Oh, yeah. And you think. Well, from 1932 to 1956, Thomas McLaughlin's grocery was located in this unlikely looking building. A friend of mine, Harlan Noss, told me that it was indeed a grocery store. In the late 1940s, his parents sent him there to make purchases. He witnessed a person asking the store owner what kind of pop he had in his walk-in cooler, not accessible to the customer's owner said, you better tell me what you want because every time I opened that cooler door, it cost me 50 cents. <laughs> it's interesting that that was a grocery store. It's had quite the facelift. The second Hy-Vee store in Iowa City was located here, which has been turned into what I think is a really great drug store and liquor store. It's a, it's a great place. Good Until price. the late 1990s. And here's the new Pioneer, which once had Me Too Grocery, which I think may have been based in Cedar Rapids, I don't know, but I think it started in Cedar Rapids, the Me Too. And of course, you remember Randall's was, oh, yeah. was oh, yeah. here. Remember one of the Smitty's? Oh, no, no oh. Not, not this one, no, no, Corvo's. Yeah. Now here's an interesting oh. grocery area. This area has been transformed drastically, has it not? Wow. Now being Hubbard Park. Yeah. But at the very end there is Ranella's Grocery. Well, Here's another part. view of it from taken from up near the old Capitol. What's that, Ed? That's Hubbard Park? Yes, that's Hubbard Park there. They just did a big excavation. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Many of the small family grocery stores allowed customers to run tabs, like we said. And then when they'd settle up, often they'd reward the children with little bags of candy as a treat. I was told that at least one of the mom and pops in town had a reputation for selling beer on Sundays. And in those days, it was illegal to sell beer on Sundays, but they would often do a brisk trade out the back door. Even policemen would buy beer from them. And then this fellow, Harlan Nost, who used to deliver groceries, he'd bring them in and routinely put the perishables right in their refrigerators for them. He remembered a little Pomeranian dog that bit him on the leg on two different occasions. Here's a listing of the number of grocery stores in the city directory over the years, and you see where it peaked in 1932, I found 50. Wow. Now we're down to perhaps eight stores. Well, obviously because they're big stores, they're big supermarkets. Let's get a little bit into the chain store industry here, beginning with the two original chain stores, which were A&P and Piggly Wiggly. Their earliest national chain store to arrive in Iowa City was an A&P, the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company. It was first established in 1859 but did not open its first small grocery store until 1912. 
They had no telephone, no credit lines, offered no delivery service. But by 1920, A&P was probably the largest retailer in the world. And there were stores, there were two locations. We've talked about them, I think, at least the one. Now the Piggly Wiggly opened its first store in Memphis, Tennessee on September 9th, 1916, perhaps the first true self-service grocery store in the nation. It was first in providing checkout stands, price marking every item in the store, providing a full line of nationally advertised brands, the use of refrigerated cases to keep products fresh, and franchising stores to independent grocers. The Piggly Wiggly opened in Iowa City on Saturday, July 20th, 1929 at 7.30 a.m., according to an article in the Press Citizen. It had a presence until at least 1939 with locations in the Ped Mall on 2 South Dubuque Street and 20 South Dubuque Street. Apparently it went by the name of Marshall Piggly Wiggly at the end of its run. Here's one of the Piggly Wiggly stores, not Iowa City, shown in 1917. Today there are actually more than 600 Piggly Wigglies in 17 states. They're mainly in smaller cities and towns, I think a, a lot in the south too. Even with the self-service concept introduced by Piggly Wiggly, the stores were still essentially dry goods grocery stores, so shoppers had to visit other stores too. In the late 1920s, a manager of a Kroger store named Michael Cullen came up with the idea of selling everything under one roof. So he opened the first King Cullen store in March of 1920 on Long Island in New York. According to Wikipedia, the King Cullen is notable for its title of America's first supermarket as recognized by the Smithsonian Institution. Well, according to one source I found, the name supermarket was first used by Cincinnati's Albert Supermarkets in 1933. Up to about 1936, shoppers at self-service groceries were given small wooden or wire baskets for them to carry as they wandered up and down the aisles. Once the baskets became too heavy or full, customers headed to the checkout lines. Well, the grocery stores wanted customers to buy more than that, of course, didn't they? So a man named Sylvan Goldman came up with the idea of a shopping cart by making a frame that would unfold and he placed two baskets in two holders on the frame, one above and one below. By 1940, shopping carts had come in the widespread usage. In 1947, an Orla Watson had the baskets permanently attached to the cart and had the carts made with hinged backs so they could be nested like we see them today. So the cart as we know it today with one big basket was introduced in the 1950s. It hasn't changed very much. The hy V store was founded by Charles Hyde and David Vredenberg. They have a little history on the wall of the new store in North Dodge as you go in, the entry on the right that's kind of nice. They opened a store in Beaconsfield, Iowa in 1930. In 1938, the company was incorporated into Hyde and Vredenberg Incorporated. They started out with the name Supply Store. In 1930. In 1935, each town's name preceded the words supply store. In 1952, by 19, oh no, it was in 1952, it became the High V by, by way of a company contest. In 1953, we got our first High V store here. They adopted the slogan where there's a helpful smile in every aisle in 1963. Today we have probably at least 235 stores in five states. I have a picture on the lower left before it was completed there. But hy now had a 60-year presence in Iowa City, surpassing every other grocery store except John's Grocery at 65 years. The Eagle we've talked about, it was based out of Milan, Illinois. Aldi. Aldi is a global discount Germany. store, Germany, founded in Germany, based in Germany, founded by the Albrecht brothers. 
So the name merely stands for Albrecht Discount. The first store to open in America was in Batavia, Illinois, in 1976, but we got one here shortly after. In fact, I think that same year, it was on at 903 Hollywood. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Now, where? The west end of Kmart. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it ran until, then the Gilbert Street store ran until last year. That was established in 1986, and the new store opened last year by Carousel Motors. Great place to buy chocolate bars. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> Fairway opened its first store in Boone, Iowa in 1938. There were some 107 stores there a couple years ago in five states. Of course, we have two fairways in Iowa City. One of the nice little touches is that they bring your groceries out to your car. Right, not open on Sunday. Econo Foods built a store in Pepperwood Place in about 1988, or I think it was. Went out of business in 1999. It said they had said that they had a lot of trouble with theft. And then remember, Cub Foods was a similar type thing, over where the new Super Wally World is, isn't it? It only lasted for 11 years too. Yeah. What about convenience stores? Up until about 1970, gasoline was pumped by service station workers, wasn't it? With, every, with very few convenience stores around. The first convenience store in Iowa City was apparently a quick shop that was located at 1814 Lower Muscatine Road. Okay. It was established in 1972 from what I could find. In 1975, the first quick trip came to town with a number of them following later. And you remember the 7-Eleven by where the new Hy-Vee is on, well, it's not new anymore on First Avenue. It didn't have gasoline pumps, but it sold a number of groceries. Today, an abundance of convenience stores exists in Iowa City. Here's my compilation of the current convenience stores. I may have missed it, one or more. There are bunches of them. And then, remember the first Walmart had very little in the way of groceries? Yep. With no perishable items, as I recall. But now they've become a full-fledged grocer with quite a comp competing component in the market. I haven't included the Super Walmart out in Coralville. I'm just confining this to Iowa City. But some Walmarts in other parts of the country have customers able to scan their items with their mobile phones while they shop. And that's getting into my topic of the future of grocery shopping. Then here is when they were transforming the former Von Mauer into Lucky's that just opened last week. If you haven't been there, it would be interesting to go in. One of my friends kind of likes the fact that he can buy a pint of beer and take it around the store while he's shopping. And they allow that. No, it's a pint, I guess. They have a little food area and, and you can so it's kind of an interesting place. Self-checkout was first used probably in about 1992 by not only grocery stores, you know, other retailers. Today, self-checkout accounts for about 40% of all checkouts. Now, I don't know about that well, statement. IV took theirs out. They sure yeah. did. Yeah, I don't know about that 40% thing. I read that someplace. But retailers have found at least one negative to this. And that would be that the customers don't buy those little impulse items when they go through the checkout area with the gum and the magazines and the candy, stuff like that. Yeah, they sure did take them out. Yep. If some groceries delivered their customers goods in the early part of the 20th century, like I showed you with Merchants United Delivery, so some do today. The Hy-Vee store on First Avenue, for example, will gather groceries for a fee they usually phone them in and deliver for an additional fee. Or you, the customer can come and pick up the groceries. You've perhaps seen something recently that I'll show you here in a moment. But why would anyone want to shop for groceries on the internet? This, this is another aspect that's coming kind of in. How would you know what your produce looks like and really be able to see those things. Other things are pretty set. 
But why would they want to do that? Well, people could obtain them that were higher quality at lower price and have larger selection and have more convenience. They may wish to shop that way, but of course there are those problems involved. It's, it's starting to come in a bit though. It's not caught on too much. But the grocery trade is about a $450 billion industry. So there's quite a potential maybe to tap into that. But the analysts think that the main reason why internet sh shopping could catch on is simply convenience. Here's the, you've seen this latest thing that Hy-Vee has advertised on a flyer now. Next time shop online, then they have the pricing. So I guess they're encouraging us to essentially, I guess, be using the internet. And, and one company called Instacart works by people ordering online and then they receive their groceries an hour or two later. Kroger has been experimenting with Scan Bag Go. Customer picks up this scanning device and scans the groceries as he picks them up and puts them in the cart. Then you don't even have to take them out of your cart when you leave. Now, I don't know how they guard against theft. Another Kroger test is using a tunnel like this. So instead of needing the barcode to be scanned by waving it over the glass in the appropriate place, it can come from all directions, or at least top and bottom. Some an analysts have suggested that in 50 years, physical grocery stores may not even exist. That sounds a little far-fetched. So in summary, here's where grocery locations are in Iowa City today. These are the, the seven what we call major grocery stores. I guess I probably didn't include Lucky's. Probably could throw Lucky's yes, in, there. in there. Which? Costco's Coralville. No, that's in Coralville. <laughs> and then if we add New Pie, Bread Garden, and Johns and Kmart, then the 24 convenience stores, there's the array of, of stores, and add Dollar Tree and Menards, several ethnic groceries, everything is kind of a, a big line of them along the bypass, isn't there? Yeah. And then kind of forming a T coming up through here and then a few other places. It's kind of interesting how they're geographically located. <clears throat> the current grocery market is dominated by the big chain groceries that offer great service, a great variety of grocery items and one-stop shopping. They offer pharmacy services. This is now, I'm zeroing in on High V. They offer post office services. They handle our dry good needs. They have great floral departments. They house branch banks. Coffee shops. They've introduced specialty coffees now like Starbucks. They've even opened restaurants with wait staffs and complete bars. Yep. I would offer that Hy-Vee should consider the adoption of at least one more service to take care of customers' final needs. And that would be this. Don't think they go over to we have, <coughs> we have the cemetery right next door. <laughs> Wonderful floral department. You can get a loan at the bank for the casket. I mean, it's perfect. I did get the permission from the new store director that it would be okay to kind of poke a little fun and do this. <laughs> but he did tell me that his big objection is that he likes to service repeat customers. <laughs> so. you, you will have possibly noticed that uh, uh, at least two of the IVs are convenient to cemetery. Yes, that's the North Dodge. <laughs> it's very close. So we've seen a big evolution in the way people have shopped for their groceries. When the mom and pops were in their heyday, we had as many as 47 grocery stores at a given moment, maybe 50. The current grocery market is dominated by the big chain groceries that offer great service and a variety, a great variety, and permit one-stop shopping. The future of the grocery business may include a predominance of internet shopping, but I think that's a ways off. The new store that they just put in at High V or on North Dodge, for example, is using all the conventional checkout methods and everything, so it's hard to say. Who can predict what will happen in the next 50 years? Thank you.